Hi, my name is Diane Guerrero, and I just talked to Kara on Really Famous, and we talked about my entire life. We talked about my show, Doom Patrol. We talked about social justice issues. We talked about defund the police and everything uh, that makes me me. My guest today is Diane Guerrero. And wow, you guys, she's really impressive. I know her, and you may too, from Orange is the New Black. She played Maritza. And also from Jane the Virgin. She was Lena, you know, Jane's best friend. And she was also in Superior Donuts. So when HBO Max asked me about her being on the show to promote her current show, Doom Patrol, I was familiar with her, but I had no idea how layered her work and her personal experiences are. Diane has a major story. Her parents emigrated to the United States from Colombia before she was born, and when she was 14, they were deported. I won't tell you the whole story, she will. And her experiences led her to become a powerful and impactful activist for immigrant rights and social equality. So we talk about that too, as well as her struggles with anxiety and finding her truth and a lot more. Speaking of which, I'm bringing back BetterHelp as a show sponsor. You know I'm a big proponent of therapy. It can be a total game changer in how you feel and how you live. If you're struggling with anything, anxiety, stress, sadness, self-esteem, relationship problems, therapy can make all the difference. And right now, I feel like it's just the right time for better help because it's an online platform and it's been around for a while now. You can get convenient, discreet, and affordable access to a licensed therapist anytime, anywhere, through your computer, your tablet, or your smartphone. You pay a low flat fee for unlimited private and secure counseling through text or chat or phone or video sessions or a combination, your choice. To start talking to your therapist in less than 24 hours, go to betterhelp.com slash really famous. Be sure to use the link betterhelp.com slash really famous to get 10% off your first month. Okay, and now back to my talk with Diane. You can catch her now playing Jane in season two of Doom Patrol on HBO Max. You can also catch my videos with Diane on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash really famous. In fact, I also have a fun and interesting talk with her Doom Patrol co-star, Jovan Wade. You can catch that as well on my YouTube channel. Yeah, so I'm excited to talk to you. I have, I've got a couple of people who you know, who I've talked to. Um, Jaime Camille is one of them. He's been uh-huh. on my show twice. Oh, okay. So I don't Love know how, him. if you guys are friends or not. Oh, but, yeah. Uh, he's great. And uh, I talked to him recently. He's one of, like, he, he was actually one of the last people I talked to before the quarantine in person. Okay. So um, yeah. that was like a different era. But, he's uh, a riot. He's awesome. I, I I love him. He's so talented and funny. Oh my goodness. Working with him on Jane the Virgin was awesome. Yeah, I bet. He's fun to watch, <laughs> obviously, and he's fun to hang out with. So this was my second time talking to him. We did the podcast uh, like probably a year and a half ago or something like that. Uh-huh, um, uh-huh. I guess right before you guys filmed the last season. So that's one I wanted to tell you about. And then the other is I also wanted to say that I spoke to your savior, about a half an hour ago. Can you guess who that is? My savior. Because he cracked up when I said, okay, because I asked him for a secret about you. And I said, I'm about to talk to Diane. So what can I, what can I say? So he told me a little story and I said, okay, so I'm going to tell her, I just talked to your savior. And he cracked oh up. We thought you would crack up. Oh my God. My savior. I can't think of, 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 any, of anyone right, else. Right. Yeah. Other than Jesus Christ. <laughs> I um, would think that. <laughs> yeah. Wilmer? No. No. Okay. Jovan Wayne. Jovan ah. Wayne. Wade. I keep saying Wayne. It's He's Wade. my savior. He said oh. that you guys filmed a scene last oh, yeah, year yeah, on yeah, Doom yeah, yeah. Patrol 
and that you that he saved you and you didn't like it and you would really like to save him in a scene or something like that. Do you remember <laughs> that or no? Yeah, it was. It was like one of the last episodes and there was like this big explosion. We're all standing there and he makes the choice to like grab me and push me and like get me out of the way. And I was like, what the fuck was that about? And he was like, he was like, ah, oh, you know, the director, you know, said that that he wanted me to like get you out of the way. I was like, I bet you're do, I bet that's your own choice. Also, Jane is not saved by anyone, so don't you dare. And you know, of course, they kept it, and so now we have a big laugh because he he saved me without my consent. <laughs> uh, and yeah, so so next time. Next time I'll be saving him in a scene. Um, yeah, but yeah. I think I think the point of the show is that we all sort of like save each other. So I'll I'll allow it. I'll okay, allow that's cool. It. Yeah. That's cool. <laughs> um, so I started reading your book. I have to tell you, I started reading your book, and I just started it yesterday. So I have a long way to go. But I was like, so, I feel like I have so much to talk to you about, and I don't want to ask you the same questions or like, have you tell the same story that you've told a million yeah. times? Mm -hmm. But I just think that, you know, there are a lot of people who haven't heard everything you've gone through. And it's like, I don't think anybody would know that about you. Like, you know, if they just see you on, or if they saw you on Orange is the New Black, or they see you on Jane or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. How do you feel about like telling all your things over and over again? Um, you know, I, I, I've gone through like this huge um I've gone through sort of all of the emotions about my story and I think that deciding to share it was one of the best things that I ever did uh for myself and for my family and for my community and so and 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 especially now as as I've I've, I've grown um and as I've learned through through sharing this process um I mean you you would have asked me like a year ago and I would say, I would have said, oh, you know, it's kind of traumatic just sort of living that over and over again. But um, I don't think I would say that now. I, I think I'm very proud of who I am and proud of that story. And I know that 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 story uh, shares um, many commonalities with a lot of people out there. And so I feel good about sharing it, um, especially if um, it motivates others to use their voice in the same way that I have. Um, I know that it's provided um, a lot of healing for me and um, has allowed me to think about myself as it relates to others a lot better. And so um, I don't have a problem with talking about it. Are we okay. recording, by the way? Or we are, definitely. Yes, oh, we're okay, recording. Okay. So um, this yeah, is like, I, I really like to just, ha okay, good. I do like to just have a regular conversation. Like sure. I don't really like the formal interviews. So mm -hmm. I'm all about getting to know you and right. just having like, as if we're just sitting down and like just at a coffee shop or something like that. Sure. Um, which we wouldn't be doing right now, but you know, at some point. So, <laughs> right. uh, yeah. So we're recording. Is that okay? Everything we've talked yeah, about yeah. so far. Oh yeah. That's fine. That's fine. Just okay. Ahead. So tell me about. Um, and I also want to talk to you about what you've been doing lately with mm -hmm. Black Lives Matter too, because yeah. I think it's amazing. I've been following you on Instagram. I know you're on Twitter too, but it seems like Instagram is much more of your thing. Yeah, it's much more my thing. I think that um, when I think when social media, you know, first blew up, and then people sort of writing their comments and how they really felt on Twitter. I don't think I was there yet, you know, to be that open. Um, in that way. And so when, when Instagram came around, um, I, I was like fine sharing photos and then I saw the power of it, um, using it as a, a platform for social justice and to talk about, um, things that I really cared about and, and to, uh, lift the voices of those, um, who I found, uh, to be very helpful to the, com any conversation that was going on. Um, so I, uh, yeah, I, I, I like IG a lot better. I mean, I have most of most people follow me there. So um, I, 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 I use it. Yeah. So you can do both on Instagram as well. Like, you don't, I feel like Twitter is like, I know Twitter can be, I like Twitter's Instagram for like a too. very specific person, a person who is like, has like ill wit and who can like, you know, um, sum up their feelings and like, you know, a, a specific number of characters. And I, I sometimes have way too much to say or just, um, yeah, I don't, I, I don't, I don't like Twitter as much, but, but now with Instagram, you can, um, 
you can post something and then it, 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 it posts something on Twitter immediately. So like the same That's thing right. gets, um, gets related. But it is totally different. I feel like I like the pictures too, and it feels friendlier on Instagram <laughs> to me. You know what I mean? And yeah. It's like, oh it's my a gosh, really yeah. pleasant thing. I always yeah. say that Twitter feels to me like it's really good for people who are super funny or people who are really political because I think yeah. that's really the platform for that. But you're doing both on Instagram. So, yeah. you know, you're doing Or the, people the, who can type really fast. Like, <laughs> I'm not a fast typer. So, like, I cannot. Oh my gosh. Sometimes I'll like spend an hour writing someone back, like even on, on like an IG comment. And I'm like, why am I wasting my life? Like I'll, I rather, I wish I could just send them a voice note or whatever of what I think, because I'm just not a fast typer. Um, so it, I, I can't, I just can't keep up. And you know, the Twitter messages keep going and going and going. And so I'm just like, Oh yeah, yeah, I cannot. Yeah, I no like good. retweeting. I like, I like supporting my friends through it and I like relaying whatever message I have on Instagram through there. Um, because I think it is a big platform. Um, right. for, for, um, you know, uh, conversations, political, political conversations and for just kind of like shady tweets. <laughs> I mean, we, we all know a lot of people use it for the shade. Um, so. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I think. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's back up a little bit. Like I don't, again, like I said, I don't want you to have to feel like you have to give the whole history, but you basically yeah. were in the U S and your parents were undocumented. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and then, so it was like a secret. You kept it a secret for a long time. And yeah. then they were, uh, discovered, I guess. Right. Is that, yeah. So I, like, basically I, I lived, um, I was born here. I was born in Jersey and, oh wait, um, hold on back up a second. Where in, I'm yeah. in Jersey right now. So where oh, in Jersey? Doing, I, I was born in Passaic, New Jersey. Do you know Passaic? Oh, okay. Of course. Passaic. Wait, we, was... My cousins are like, it's Passaic, not Passaic. Oh, um, I call it Passaic. But yeah. it's Passaic. It's Passaic. <laughs> Got it. Yeah, yeah. The, every time I would come, uh, I was born in Passaic, but I was raised in Boston. And so when I would go visit my cousins, I'd be like, you know, I, I would say some shit like Passaic and they would be like, it's Passaic. God, you could tell you're from Boston. And, you know, like they would just crack on me all the time. Um, so, yeah, so I was born in Passaic, New Jersey. We were there till we were three. My parents emigrated in the 80s. Um, my aunt was already living in New Jersey. I had an uncle in New York. Um, so I, we already had family emigrating um, and my family came here, you know, for a lot of the same reasons that other families come here for better job opportunities, um, just, uh, 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 to live, you know, whatever they thought the American dream was. Right. And so I was born, um, and was raised in Boston. Um, and they, um, I talk about in my book how, I mean, my entire childhood was focused on my parents, um, getting legal status and it, sort of failing on them every single time they tried. And so I remember going to lawyer's offices with my folks. I remember being scared of people knocking on the door. I remember having to um, uh, understand, I guess, the difference between like the truth and um, like lying, like bad lying and then lying to protect your family. And, and that was very, very confusing for me growing up. Um, and it put a lot of stress. So I grew up with a lot of anxiety because, you know, ultimately what my family being discovered as undocumented meant that my family would be separated and that I would be left alone and that that would be the end of my family. And so that was something that I always feared um, and was such a fucking pain in the ass. <laughs> and so... Um, yeah, so my nightmare sort of came true when I was 14, um, when my bo when both parents were um, taken away. I got home from school and they were gone. And, you know, and that was sort of to be expected. I, uh, my parents always prepared me for the worst um, or the sort of inevitable. I mean, we, we'd hope that it wouldn't happen, um, but um, because of the immigration policies and because of the immigration system in our country, it was just um, not possible for us. And so my parents left to, they were deported to Colombia. So I had to experience um, the carceral, carceral system, going to visit them at the detention center. I mean, all that was super traumatic for me and for them. Um, and so that really always, that stayed um, in, 
in me. And I think that, um, you know, over the years, any rhetoric that I heard about Im the immigrant community or people who were deported was very negative. So it wasn't something that I was very open to talking about because I didn't, I didn't want to bring shame on myself. I was very ashamed. I was ashamed of my, of my family because that's exactly what they sort of, you know, the propaganda that is out there is to be, to be ashamed um, in this way. And so I never talked about it. I, I wanted to stay in the country. I didn't go back with my family. We had no money. We, we had no assets. It, it was really hard when you, when you go, I, I had grown up here all my life. So going to Colombia just seemed kind of out of the question for me, especially because my, my family didn't have the means. And I, I hear I was attending uh, a pilot school, public education was available um, in order to go to a private school or a um, ESL school in, uh, in Colombia, you need a lot of money. Um, and we didn't have that. So I was like, okay, I'm going to stay here and I'm going to figure out um, what I'm going to do. I had a very strong and beautiful community that took me in. I had friends, uh, family friends that took me in. And so I spent um, my freshman year and sophomore year of high school with one of my friends and her family. And then I went over to a different family for my junior and senior year. And then I worked throughout the, that entire time. I mean, I, when I started working when I was 14. I was working at this like uh, fashion warehouse for women that would l allow me to work there on weekends. And then as doing I got what? Older, what were you doing? What uh, were you folding, doing there? Oh, folding scarves and oh, okay. uh, hiding in the clothes because I fucking didn't want to deal with any, anyone. I would like you know, I'd work the cash, the cash register, or I would put clothes away. It was just, I mean, imagine a big warehouse of just like discount clothing. Um, and just tons of shoes and clothes and scarves and coats, things like that. Um, so I would go and like organize sizes and fold scarves and things like that. And then as I got older, I got jobs at, um, I was working at Barnes and Noble, uh, cafe. I was working at the bookshop. I worked at, uh, a place called I Party, which is exactly like Party City. So it's like a party store. So I made balloons and played with toys all day. Um, but I, yeah, I. But how I, were I, you feeling at that point, though? Like, I, I knew you said it was traumatic, but I have to yeah. back up also, if you don't mind. Like, I feel oh, like. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Cut, just cut me off. Whole, I just go on and on. <laughs> I appreciate you sharing it like that. And I said, I don't want you to have to tell your whole story. It's obviously yeah, not your yeah. whole story, it's just part of the story. And sure, it's not just sure. one story, it's not the story in your life. Like, there are right, many right, stories. Right. Right, right, um, right. You know, it's sometimes when people say, oh, everybody has a story, but I'm like, that's not real. I don't really feel like it's a story. Like, you know, no, like, everybody's I, I, a million we, are stories. we are multitudes, right? Yeah. We have so many different stories. I ha That was just a, like what I did to survive at that time when my parents weren't there, weren't there, weren't physically right. there with me. And so even though I was living with these people, I knew that I had to work. And that's something that my family really instilled in me that um, that work ethic, you know, if you wanted anything in life, it wasn't going to be handed to you. You had to work and you had to be happy with the work that you had. Um, but, but I, I mean, I guess what I mean by that is my dad was never bitter in the work that he did, even though it was grueling and it was, um, sometimes, um, the environment was violent or, um, degrading and he still, um, was very glad that that he had the opportunity to work and feed his family and and I and, and I took that um and I wanted I knew that I had the opportunity I knew I had the language I knew I had the opportunity to at least try and make something um better for myself and at least survive and eventually the dream was to help my family out Okay. Right. So yeah. I was just thinking also, like as you're before everything happened and before you were 14, I would feel like you would be nervous or anxious all the time, just feeling like it could happen at any minute and your whole world would crumble. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That was, that was my reality. Yeah. But I, but my family also on top of like, sure. Um, having me involved in their adult conversations about, you know, the possibility of deportation, they also gave me a lot of love and a lot of uh, freedom to be, uh, to explore art 
and be artistic and express myself in, in many, in all of the ways that I wanted to express myself. And so that was also very helpful that, and I took that, um, along, along with me. Um, so yeah, so along with me having to grow up really fast and, and making sure that I, I was also a part of protecting my family. Um, I was also a very curious child and wanted to see myself in literally every position that was available out there. So I had visions of being an actor. I had visions of being on stage. I had visions of being a doctor or a lawyer um, or uh, <laughs> I just, I love to tell stories and, and I love to defend people. Um, you know, I, I was, uh, I always, I was always very taken by stories of, of children suffering or the world suffering. Um, and I always wanted to or I, or I just like to entertain and to make people happy and to entertain my parents. You know, they, they were always so stressed out. And uh, I, I knew that they took comfort in my silliness and my entertaining them. Um, so, so that, that was, that was the environment that I grew up in. It was gotcha. a very, very yeah. loving environment. Um, and so and that, makes that all kind of, the difference. it did make all the yeah. difference. It, it really did like outweigh all of the bad stuff. Um, and I really, truly believe to this day is what really gave me that push to be so resilient and to find um, a way uh, to to try to 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 be happy, to be happy, and right. to not and to not give up on and and not see as anything and not see anything as impossible. Right. Well, obviously you had to see things like that to be in the place that you are now. Sure. It would not have happened had you not had that belief oh system. Oh yeah. Right. For sure. I feel like, you know, I, I, what I saw and I, I think was that every time that I gave myself an opportunity, I saw good come out of that in anything, whether it was to try out for the choir, to try out for cheerleading, um, try out for lacrosse. I mean, things that I had never even been exposed to, I would try out, or if I saw community in it, or if I saw support in it, uh, I went for it. I wasn't the greatest academically, um, because, um, because of everything going on at home and because, you know, the education being what it is for, for, for kids of color. Um, I, I, and because I had learning disabilities that I had no idea about, but I did see that I had a fighting chance if I was imaginative enough, if I gave myself a chance that I could learn that I could be mentored. And so I saw that at a very, very young age and I kept that up even till now. Um, and I think that's what really gave me, um, an edge really um because and, and that's what i try to tell people all the time is like if you give yourself an opportunity if you allow yourself to imagine something different for yourself you absolutely can achieve it and that's not just bullshit and that's not just lip service i know it because i have tried it um and i you know so even though i would look i would see the world and i i saw that it wasn't necessarily designed for me I saw that I could find a place somewhere um, if I was eager enough, if I was curious enough, uh, and if I was loving enough. And, and that really took me a long way. So that's interesting. So it sounds like it was a conscious decision on your part to think that way. Also, you, were, you had it naturally, but you also actually said to yourself, I'm going to approach life this way. Yeah? <laughs> I mean, I, I think, I don't know if I was... I knew that I was like that from, from, from the beginning. Yeah. Because it was something that I just kept seeing examples of, of that kind of approach to life that would work. Um, sure. There were moments of great pain and disappointment um, because I, you, you know, you can't always achieve everything that you want and there's not always a place or room for you if it's not designed for you. But I did see in many instances that that kind of attitude did uh, take me a long way. And so, yeah, I, 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 I would do it and that would set the precedence to my next endeavor. And I would keep, and even in times where I was like, this will not work out for me or this is not for me or I'm giving up, 
if I just gave it that extra push, or if I just tried one more time, or if I just allowed myself to just show up, things would happen. Things would happen. Amazing. Whether yeah. and even if I wouldn't get it, I would, I would, I would learn an experience, or I would have an experience that I could take uh, to the next step, or or take to the next uh, endeavor, or whatever I propose myself to. So um, like, how did that work out with acting? I guess that was, um, that's a big advantage too, I would think in that field. Uh -huh. Sure. I mean, you have to have an imagination. <laughs> you and have like to have a, an, imagination. an ability to persist, right? To say, okay, I didn't get it, but I'm going to keep going. Like, I think that's where, uh, where the, the line is drawn for plenty yeah. of people because it's really tough. It is such a tough industry. And like, you know, I didn't know about, I mean, sure, I knew about systemic barriers. And I knew that as a brown woman, that, you know, there weren't that many stories being told about me and my experience, or I just I knew that 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 representation in film and TV were very limited uh, for, for people like me. And so I didn't really understand all of like what I actually got to live. I didn't really understand like um, how, how limiting it, it really was. Um, but because I had this experience of persisting and kind of just throwing my hat in the ring or just trying just to see, um, it, it really, it really made all the difference. Um, and, and, uh, and in those moments where I felt like giving up, um, I persisted, I would just say, you know what? Um, I acknowledge that I also didn't come into it with like this sort of delusion. And I'm not, and I'm not saying that, I mean, you have to be imaginative and you have to be a dreamer. Sure. But you have to understand that this is a craft and you need to be educated. And so that was, I mean, that's always been me. My father always, my mom and dad always um, made a point to anything that I do, even if I'm interested in, uh, in it, I have to study. I have to educate myself and see if that is for me. So that's what I did. I, I, I used, I, I mean, I already had been to a performance arts high school. Like I knew I was artistic. I knew I had a flair or a knack or whatever it is, or at least potential. Um, and I just had to see it all the way through. If I were to, if I was actually strong enough to, um, persist in, in this business and to, um, keep going. Um, so I did, I, I took classes and, I educated myself. I, I soon built a community of, of people that were also following this dream, that were doing the same thing. And I just told myself, you know what? I'll go for this and see what happens. I'll go for this and see what happens. If it doesn't happen for me the way that I envisioned, that's okay. I'm, I, I was fine. Um, I was, I've, I've always been very malleable. So I always knew that if it wasn't acting, that it, it would be storytelling in a different way. Or maybe I even thought at one point, maybe I could go into casting. Perhaps I have an eye, uh, for, for people who have talent because I, I love, I love watching, uh, an actor's process or, um, an artist's process. I love to see them green and then, uh, get get to a point where, where they've learned and, and they're showing us something different. I love all of that. So um, I gave myself room for all of those possibilities. And I think that was, uh, that was very helpful because I just kept going. It wasn't like when I would get a no, I'd feel like my whole world was crumbling. I would say, okay, I got a no, but that means I just have to study harder. I just need to keep going because um, maybe I'm not the person that they're looking for, perhaps the audition wasn't great. I'm going to continue taking classes and learning and seeing if I can get better or something else will happen. So where, like, so at what point, where were you when you landed Orange is a New Black? Because you said also, like, I'm really interested in the actor's process. So I feel like there's a mm -hmm. lot of interesting processes going on just on that one set alone, right? So oh, a yeah. lot of very interesting actors. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Where was I in my process? In life, kind of. Oh my that. gosh. I was very afraid of everything. Um, I just... Wait, hold on. I'm <gasps> not getting that from you at all. When did that start? Oh, really? Okay. 
explain. I mean, there was still, I mean, I, I don't know how I've been able to balance sort of this um, deep need to be involved and deep need to be, to participate and find out if I am, could be good at something and then balance all of my insecurities and sometimes crippling anxiety. I don't know how those two came together, but that's kind of how I have operated my entire life. Being scared shitless and going for it anyway. <laughs> so interesting. So uh, right, that's really probably not that common. So, <laughs> no. but also let's just break that down for a second. Sure. So the part sure. that you were always like so scared that would cause a lot of people to go away from it, but it helped you get places. Yeah. Right. Yes. You know what I mean? Like not just the other side of it, but like actually both of them, I think, mm -hmm. because you would put yourself in situations that were sort of pushing the envelope, I guess. Yeah. So I maybe it's those two ingredients. Yeah. I mean, it, it was also probably, I mean, it was very exhilarating as well because I just wanted it so bad. I, you know what it, you know what it comes down to? I really wanted to be seen. And I don't, I don't know if, if then, I felt the same way, like, or if I understood the definition of being seen as I see it now, but maybe subconsciously, I just wanted to be seen. I just wanted to be heard. I wanted to participate. I, I wanted to, to, um, I wanted to play. I wanted to have that opportunity too. And that feeling was so strong that I think it, um, I just kind of, trumped over the fear um but and 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 that you know it, it worked for some time it, it's not it doesn't work for me now <laughs> it doesn't work to be operating from a place of fear now um knowing everything that i know knowing that i am enough knowing that i um am that i belong all all of these all of these things that i've learned along the way like I couldn't be fearful now, um, even though I, I still am and I still struggle with anxiety and, and uh, insecurities about, you know, how, um, yeah, I struggle with insecurities and, and whether I'm enough or not or smart enough or, you know, all of those feelings that you have. And it was just building up my, my heart. It was building up my, my, my skin, my tolerance. Um, um, for any challenge that came my way. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, so mm -hmm. interesting. So what was it, therapy that did it? Or therapy, writing the book? Oh my gosh. Uh, what did what? That helped you not be, work from a place of fear like <laughs> it used to and to manage the anxiety. Yeah, it was definitely uh, sharing my story and sharing this book. Absolutely. Because so when, when I, I, I was at this place of fear and even still I got Orange is New Black, that happened for me. Um, and I could not believe it. I'm telling you, I mean, even though I was kind of like, I'm just going to keep on trying and see what happens. You know, I think that at the time that I auditioned for that, I was like, fuck, if I don't get this, if I don't get this, then where am I? What is this? What is happening? Um, because I just felt I was so right for it. Ah, um, uh, okay. So that and, that was what even that would make it even more stressful. Then I mean, the fact to, that you're I had to be so right much. for it. Are you kidding me? You're talking about. I mean, you're talking about a woman in prison, and we're and we're talking about a Latinx woman who, um, who because of because of her childhood trauma she is in prison. Um, you know, that, that is something that I, I had lived with all of my life. I, that's what I saw in my neighborhoods. I saw people getting arrested. I saw people, I saw families being separated, uh, because of, uh, incarceration. I mean, this is something that I really knew a lot about. And so, um, once, once I, once I did get it, then I saw all of the things that I really had to work on. And I saw that I had to do a lot of work, not just in acting or as an actor, obviously that goes without saying, I mean, you get a job, you, you are working with incredibly seasoned actors. You got to step up your game. You have to learn from them and all of that I was getting, but I also learned that I had to do some deep work within myself to stay in this game or else I was going to 
either that was going to be my last job, I wasn't going to be able to sustain um, work in, in this field, or I was going to drive myself mad, really, um, because I wasn't settled in my heart. Um, so every, I mean, being on Scent of Orange and the Black was, it was very exciting and it was very beautiful, but it was also very, uh, taxing because I didn't have those tools, you know, I didn't have the, I didn't, I hadn't done that work for myself and I wasn't, I wasn't operating from a place of truth. You see, I wasn't telling anybody who I really was. I remember somebody asking me, you know, where are your parents? What did they do? And I was like, oh, um, you know, as I normally did in college or in high school, my parents moved back to Columbia because they're uh, small business owners and they just didn't want to live here anymore. And I caught myself saying that and it hurt me so much. Um, and it just started that that kind of behavior, that kind of avoiding um, avoidance for me was really chipping away um, at something much deeper than just my ego. Um, and so I had to do some, do some work. And it just so happened that the movement was there. People were already doing that work on the ground for immigrant rights, uh, for uh, um, doing, doing that community building that, that, that was needed uh, for our people. And so right around that time uh, when, uh, uh, who was oh, 45 was was campaigning so that for that 2016 election um i already started seeing a lot of that negative rhetoric even more so about the immigrant community which i was very much a part of and so it was kind of like i started twitching and i couldn't hold i couldn't hold it in anymore you know i couldn't i couldn't i could no longer say or think that that what was happening in the world or what was happening in this country didn't affect me. Um, and so it was kind of like word vomit. I, I kind of just started saying it, started saying my parents were deported. This is my life. This is who I am. And then of course, um, you know, said in, in, in the right platform, um, it kind of just took off and I was sort of forced to do that work, but I did that work along with you. Um, I, I wasn't like, it wasn't like I came out and shared once I already had done, you know, all this deep uh, introspection or this deep work for myself. I like literally grew in front of people's eyes, in front of these reporters eyes, in front of, um, in, in te on television, I was growing right in front of you. And that was a traumatic experience, but something that I really needed to go through. That is so interesting. So it was like, what was happening outside was what pushed you to have to deal with it mm -hmm. and live, go from living in a place that wasn't truthful. So right. it's interesting. And then well, be because I, I was like, I thought that I would be seen once I became an actor. And once I had like, once I got like a big show or a big movie, I was like, then I'll be seen. And then once I did get that, I still didn't feel seen. And then I realized it was because I needed to be honest. If I was going to be here representing myself, representing my family, representing my community, I had to be honest and I had to right. be truthful. And that truth is ugly. It's messy. Some people ain't going to like it. It's offensive to some folks. Oh, it's too sad for some folks. Oh, people don't want to hear you pull the race card. Lots of shit comes up from it. And so, uh, but, but that's what the truth is. It's messy. It's complicated. It's, it's tragic. It's sad. Um, and, but it also has the power uh, to help others and to, and to heal others and heal yourself. So interestingly, so as you said that it was kind of like you were growing up or growing and be, uh, getting to that place in front of all the reporters and whatever in the media. So like, mm -hmm. and that was traumatic. So like <laughs> what happened exactly that tra that was traumatic in, God, in doing that? Everything, everything, everything being presented as the girl whose parents were deported. It was like, I no longer had a name, you know, it was uh. like, this is the, you know, I felt like I was on a milk carton um, because, because with, with that comes with that you know, when you're honest in that way, and especially if people are not um, well versed on some of the issues, and especially if people are not empathetic 
to to you and your experience, um, then there's going to be a lot of room um, to, you know, misconstrue your words, to kind of sum up your life experience in a sentence. Uh, <laughs> right. So of, it wasn't necessarily that they were mean, but it's that you those things were hard to be exposed oh, there was, to. I mean, there's a, there was a range of things. People were nasty. People were mean. People said, uh, go back to your country. Yeah. People said, go back to your country. People said, well, what are you complaining about? You're an actress. What do you care? What do you, what do you, you know, like as if I can't have feelings because I have achieved something. It was like, it was like, we let you become an actor in this country and we let you live out this dream. So how bad can this system be? Or how sad could you possibly be? Your parents broke the law and that's that. And so because I hadn't done that emotional work that I needed to do, I wasn't prepared uh, to, to handle um, really anything, e even if it was positive or merely curious or, um, and certainly wasn't prepared to handle um, negative comments or, or people not understanding or not wanting to understand your situation. But you kept going again. So that's another example. Oh, absolutely. Because I treated every moment as like, this is the, this is the moment where I'm going to rise up like a fucking Phoenix. You know, this is the time where they're not going to get me and they're not going to make me cry. And I'm going to explain myself clearly and eloquently. And I'm going to be, uh, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to feel good this time about, about sharing. And honestly, there was also the, the side of like students and young kids in my community that look like me that were like, Hey, this is my life too. I'm afraid that my parents are going to be deported. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid that my neighbors is going through this, or I also feel unseen and I feel discriminated against, or I feel uh, like I, I have so much to say too. And so that was what, again, outweighed the bad. When, when it, I saw right. comments yeah. like that, when I saw little girls come up to me and be like, I love Orange is the New Black. I can't, I love seeing, seeing you guys up there. I love, I love that you shared your story with us. I read your book, you know, that I didn't even, that part, um, I didn't even understand how that, what, what that was going to do to me. Um, and, and, and at that point I just saw it as, oh, okay, this is, I'm doing my part of speaking out and this will encourage others to do the same. And it wasn't like, oh, I'm this person who is doing all of this work. So look at me. It was like, oh, now others are also going to join in this fight and we're going to do the work together. And that was exciting not to be sitting by yourself with all of that heaviness, all of that burden on your shoulders when you have an entire community who is also sharing your experience. And then you're like, okay, that is empowerment. That is, that is something I can, I can hold on to. I'm not alone. I have people who care about me. There are people out there who also feel this way and, and all, and, and then all of a sudden you just don't feel alone anymore. And then you have that strength to, to keep going and exploring, um, all of the ways that, that your mind works and that your heart works. And I knew from that, that day on that I was a part of that, that social justice and making sure, um, that that we were heard was going to be a part of my life. Um, and, and now even more, uh, uh, with, with the black lives matter movement. Um, I, I, I've, I've sort of been re-energized, uh, in a way. I mean, I've always been in this, you know, I've been true to this. <laughs> totally, cl very clearly. <laughs> I'm not new to this. I didn't just yes. find out racism existed in the country or in the right. world. I'm not that, you know, I, I, I'm not knocking people for learning and, and, and for, and for joining this fight. Absolutely. But, but, but I you've have, been in it for a long time, you know, all about it for, and you have for a yeah. while. I mean, mm -hmm. it's what I saw. It's what I grew up yeah. with. And so finally to, to see people, uh, to see people's blinders sort of come up. Um, and also all the learning that I'm doing, um, and, and, and all the ways that I was silencing myself because of, you know, I didn't, I, I didn't want to offend or I didn't want to, I was tone policing myself. Like these are all terms that I'm just coming to grips with or like, you know, uh, being, 
being gaslit or, um, you know, uh, people sort of diminishing your experience. Like I, I lived through all of that and I didn't have terminologies for it. I didn't have words for it. And so um, this is sort of a, a resurgence in me, an activation in me to be who I want to be, which is a fucking freedom fighter. Right? I, I want to be there for my siblings. I want to be there and, and, and I, and I want to be a part of, of, of the charge for change. Um, and so um, it, it has given me new life. Uh, for this fight, you know, I in in a in a world or in a place where I was sort of couldn't really find myself and and sometimes losing steam. Um, I'm all steamed up. Steamed yeah, up. yeah. You and uh, and like so many other people, which is so <laughs> yeah. great. It's such it's such a, a unique and special time, and I think it's amazing. And I think everybody we're all learning so much because yeah. even like you're saying, like you were right on the forefront of it, or like maybe not forefront or whatever you want to say, but I would say forefront. But all along, you've been very aware of racism existing, and you were involved with Black Lives Matter before George yeah. Floyd and and everything. And so even you're learning things now. It's such a an eye opener, I think, for like so many of us, really. And you think Absolutely. that you, you know, you think that you know, or you think that you are, you know, feel one way or, you know, like the whole thing with being an anti-racist racist, um, versus being silent. Like that was an eye opener for me too, because yeah. of course, like I'm totally not a racist at all. Never have been, never, never even came close. But for me, it was an eye opener of like, oh, it's really like my duty as a white person to mm -hmm. come up and talk and stand up for what's right and like talk about these things to other people so that other people do too. And it's like it's really yeah. an eye opener. Yeah, it's it's our responsibility to actively be anti-racist. Yeah. I mean, and even in, in me, I'm I am a brown woman, but I understand that my, uh, I, I have to understand what my connection or what my hold is or, my proximity, what my proximity to whiteness is and how I benefit from that, right? Even as a brown person who's been, whose parents are deported, I know that I also have benefited from ideas of whiteness or uh, uh, um, I know that my proximity to whiteness has, has allowed me benefits that I know some of my black counterparts have not. Um, right. And so that is the work that I'm doing. I'm, you know, thinking about how merely being not racist is not enough. You have to do the work to be anti-racist because this is something that has been plaguing our world for over 500 years and more than that, more than that, but it has plagued, plagued this country for over 500 years. I know people say 400, but I'm adding another hundred. Um, <laughs> and so it is work <laughs> that is necessary. It is work that I understand is so a part of me. I, I know that my freedom is tethered to the freedom of my black siblings. I know that. And I know, so anything that I've been fighting for immigration, immigrant rights, um, uh, and you know, uh, just the right to, to, to have my family here that is connected to, um, to black lives and, 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 and their freedom. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Such a bit like eye opening is really the thing that I keep thinking of. Mm -hmm. Um, so, your parents, so your parents stayed there. Did they, were they aware of like what was going on for you or like your development, your personal development, your acting career? Yeah, of course. I mean, you know, I, I, I went to college for political science. Uh, and so, I mean, I knew I wanted to, I knew I was very interested in history and interested in, um, social justice and, and all the inequalities of the world. And I wanted to learn more about that. So my parents were very proud of me for going to college. And I mean, I don't even know. I mean, I, I know how I did that. I did that through the support of my community and my, and my school and, and my parents. Um, but when I did that, my mom was like, so are the arts not a thing anymore? And I'm like, mom, I'm going to become a lawyer. And that's that. And you know, there's no place for me uh, in, in acting and I'm, I'm not going to be whatever you thought I was going to be. My mom always thought I was going to be an artist, either a singer or an actor or something. And I, I think after a while, um, I, I just thought that, especially my senior year of high school, I just, I just thought that I needed to do something practical. 
um, that having that kind of dream was only afforded to people who had that kind of support, you know, family support, mon monetary support. Um, so I, I didn't see a, a place for me there. What I didn't realize is that you need that support in any field you go in and you need yeah. uh, that fire in any uh, or that passion for any job that you do or any career that you go into. So um, although my experience was very pleasant, um, uh, learning um, or being in classes, uh, po political classes and things like that um, was very rewarding. I still wanted to be, um, I still wanted to express myself in a different way. Um, and so acting actually, I started taking acting classes after I was having a lot of mental health problems. Um, I was suicidal. I, I, um, because I, I hadn't, I wasn't dealing with any of my issues. I was just kind of like, I thought I'm going to go to college. I'm going to make something of myself and boom, that's that. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I if only that, it was that simple. If only it was that simple. Like I made it this far. I'm a good girl. I, I did everything right. Yeah. Um, but you don't, you don't, you don't really expect uh, to, I guess, be affected by everything that's around you. And I was still missing my parents. I was still dealing with um, not understanding fully why, why this was happening to me and, and, and why I had all these uncontrollable feelings of sadness, of despair. Of, and, and so I had to, I basically hit a very low place in my life where I was basically ordered to go to therapy because I was very, I was close to killing myself. And, um, And, um, and so I did, and that was one of the best things that ever happened to me. And one of the things that, that, that person I was working with at the time suggested I do was take acting classes for no other oh, reason. That's so just interesting. To, yeah. Really? For no other reason other than just to, um, bring back art in my life and bring that imagination back into my life. Um, just to, to do it as a hobby. Um, and, and to see if, if, if that sparked any joy inside me and it really did, it really it did. did. And, and it changed, it changed my life. And, um, and then I, you know, I kind of gave up on, on the whole lawyer idea. Um, I, after college, I, I did a paralegal program. I was like, I'm going to be a paralegal first and then I'm going to be a lawyer. And, um, but that was a lot of work and I wasn't, I wasn't there to receive that yet. And so I, just kept on taking acting classes, working at different bars and restaurants until um, I decided to give myself like a real shot. And I went to New York and I started auditioning and taking classes and things like that. And, and here I am. And here you are. Yeah. But that so, was art, art saved me. Yeah. <laughs> really. um, so, okay. So what are you, so you, are you in LA now? Is that where you live or? I am really? in Los Angeles. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. I, I moved to LA after orange. Um, right, after, Orange was filmed in New York, right? New York, yeah. And after Jane, too, I guess Jane was shot here, uh, Jane the Virgin. And I, I just kept auditioning, and I just kept coming back to California for pilot season. And I would come, and I, I was just so determined. I was like, I'm gonna get a show. I want to get a show. You know, I had Orange Is New Black, but I wanted more. I think once I got a taste of of what you know, what this business was or what the possibilities were for me if I just continue to allow myself the opportunity to compete uh, or to show my stuff, uh, <laughs> if you will, then then something could come out of it or, you know, and I just kept learning every every experience that I had was so rewarding. The auditions, the, you know, being crushed, the, um, you know, oh, you almost had it, but um, oh, but it went to this, you know, and, and, you know, cycle and repeat, right. That yeah. just kept happening. But I saw that the more work that I put in, the more roles that I would get or the, the closer I would get. And so, um, my dream was to, um, work on orange, but also be able to work on other shows. And I, and I did get that experience. Um, and I kept auditioning and I got several, um, I got a, a few pilots um, that didn't ever go anywhere, but I, I saw that 
uh, as a possible that uh, that I was booking that I that I could continue on this journey and so I did and um I got a show I got a series regular on uh, a show called Superior Donuts which was a that's multi-cam. with uh, um Jed Hirsch is that right Jed that's Hirsch? Jed Hirsch okay, yeah, yeah which yeah, was yeah. like which was like my dreams come true because as a kid I would watch um I would watch TV land taxi? Uh-huh. and taxi. I'd watch yeah, yeah. taxi. I watched Laverne and Shirley. I watched Mary Tyler Moore. I did. I yes. and that's kind of how I got a lot of my comedy um, and, and how I would express myself. And I would like imitate um, these giants. And so getting a chance to work with Judd Hirsch and Katie Seagal. And then of course, um, Jermaine Fowler and um, Rel Battle and Maz Jabrani. Uh, these incredible um, David Kechner, these incredible comedians. I was like, are you kidding me? Like this, it was just a dream come true. And, and that's when I, that's, that's what started building my confidence. And I was just uh, like, damn, uh-huh. maybe I can do this. Uh-huh. Um, and, and so when I did that, and then of course that gave me um, some of the steam that I needed to audition for Doom Patrol um, and which I got. Um, I got like the, the role of my dreams was to, to play a complicated and, uh, emotional and, uh, troubled young woman. And, and I got a chance to do that and I wanted to be a fucking superhero and I got to do it. So and really with nothing. truth and you can do and it with, with truth and I can do it with truth. I can do it with being myself. Yes. I could do it. I could do it with yelling to the rooftops like, hey, guess what? My parents were deported and I struggled really hard to get here, but I'm here and yeah, I think I could be a superhero. What's up? And and they said, Yes, of course you can. Um and and and, and that was that was that was beautiful. That was that was a turning point for me. Um and it continues to be so freaking rewarding. Um Doom Patrol has been I mean, all of the shows that, that, that I've done and, and all the work that I've done thus far has been incredible experiences. But Doom Patrol is the first time that I think that I'm playing a full, full, fully realized person. Right. Um, That's so. interesting. Yes. <laughs> with, uh-huh. with many, many sides. Right. Sure. Right. Because it's interesting when you think about when you think about Lena from Jane. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, there was, you didn't see that much. So I can see what you're saying. I mean, I know you probably don't want to be like, oh yeah, it, was, it wasn't no, uh, no, it's, deep it's enough. The, it's the truth. But yeah, I could see. Sometimes you don't go there. Yeah. Yeah. It might've been frustrating, right? Because it wasn't really a full, I guess you was, as you said, like a fully realized person. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that, and that's okay. Sometimes like that's what you, you have to go through to see what you want and how, what kind of stories you want to tell. Um, and I saw that, you know what, this was, this was an opportunity for me to learn. And all of, all of those gigs before, before Doom were preparing me for, for that, you know, fully realized. Oh, uh, and character. then you can appreciate, appreciate it when it comes and you know how to really fully put yourself behind the character, right? Oh, absolutely. And I already had so much experience. <laughs> with being on different sets and, you know, different coasts, um, working with different people. I mean, I had worked on a, a, a single cam dark comedy that, that talked about real issues, real um, women issues, talked about police brutality. We talked about so many, you know, real things on Orange to go to um, Jane um, and, and, and share a, um, a Latinx family story, which is something that I always wanted to see on television. Um, and then being able to be part of a, a another kind of new medium, which was multicam um, live audience uh, comedy was, was extremely um, helpful. And I, and I learned so much through that. Um, and that, so that, and then of course all that prepared me for, uh, for the, uh, for the role that I have now. Right. So Doom, uh, Doom Patrol season two is on HBO Max. Where was the first season? Was that on? Um, DC Universe. DC Universe. Okay. So now it's H- HBO Max, mm-hmm, which mm-hmm. I, I am almost positive that a lot of people have no idea what HBO Max is. Do you know what it is? I do know. And I think I have a thing okay. here. Yes. Oh, I really? Do. They tell you what to say? Oh, yeah. That's they're like, so Doom funny. Patrol season two premieres June 25th. 
Yeah. Uh, 25th on HBO Max and DC Universe. Um, actually, that's all it says. Um, oh, so HBO just to say what HBO Max is, that's so funny. <laughs> HBO Max is just HBO's new platform that um, encompasses, um, I guess, other platforms as well. So it, it has, so HBO, H, HBO Max now includes um, platforms like DC Universe. Got it. Um, okay. I think so it's more. CBS, it's bigger. It's it's just more. HBO Max is exactly what it what it says. It's just Max. It's just yes. more. Okay. Um, DC Universe launched. It, its first launch was last year, and so, of course, with so many platforms um, that people have, um, it wasn't getting a lot of reach. And so, um, the hope was to have a platform like HBO to come in and. Um, for us to have a home there as well. So now we have a home on DC Universe, which is our, our original house. And then we also, but we also have a home on HBO Max. Got it. So that definitely expands mm-hmm. who's going to be able to, to oh, catch yeah. it. So that's a good thing. And this is your first fully realized character. That's a big deal. Yeah. Um, I love playing Jane. Jane is a, a character who has um, DID, Dissociative Identity Disorder. And uh, we try so hard um, to 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 make her real and um, and 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 not just a caricature. Um, and and I re- I really find that that the writers have done a fantastic job with that. And of course, I connect so much to this character as a person who has suffered from trauma and who has uh, experienced just so many deep emotions of loss and longing. Um, and I think that, that, um, that, that Jane, the character of Jane allows me to really explore all of those different emotions, um, and, and be very expressive with those emotions. And that has been a dream come true, A, and B, just so cathartic for me. I really, really, really needed this role. (laughs) And I'm, I'm, I'm just so glad to be a part of, um, of, of Doom Patrol. I love working with, um, with all of the actors and, um, I love just sharing these stories. I wanted to be a part of, uh, telling a story that was deeply rooted in, um, the human psyche and actual real human trauma, but also, um, very fantastical and extraordinary. What is the upside of fame? Do you consider yourself famous? First of all, do you feel famous? No. I don't feel famous. Um, I think famous is, I think, reserved for, I think, another kind of person. Um, it's interesting. I've never really I've never had that question. I mean, I've, I've had people come up to me and be like, you're famous. And I'm like, that's definitely not me. I'm like, out of all the things that I am, I don't think that's one of them. Um, I I think that... I mean, the, the, the only upside of, of doing this kind of work, of, of being on, on television and having this platform is being able to talk about uh, the things that I really want to talk about and, 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 raise, um, and, and, and raise others in, in the process. So um, if this helps my community be seen, um, then, then that's the upside, I guess. Okay. So you'll take um, it for that. I'll take for it. Sure. Yeah. So, um, if fame is for like other people, who are those other people? Like, who do you consider famous? Like who, who do I consider famous? Um, are we, are we saying that famous is a negative thing? <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, not at all but if what how does that change your answer I'm so curious I don't know I, I feel like I feel like fame or saying that you're famous or wanting that neg- normally has sort of like a negative um connotation and I don't want to be I don't want to be tied to that so I think that I I love storytelling and I love um people recognizing my work and being inspired by it Um, and I, and I love expressing myself through telling stories. So that, that is the good part. 
And I think the negative part of fame is like this sort of idea of like a hierarchy and like people here and then other people here. That's, that's what I don't like. And I don't consider myself above anyone. And I certainly don't consider people who are very, very well known in the media to be above anyone else. Um, even though that's sort of like, um, what goes along with the word fame and, and whoever sort of has it or feels it. Um, who's famous for the right reasons? <laughs> President Obama. That's, that's famous. Yeah, that's, um, and that's good famous. And that's good famous. I guess, yeah, I guess you're right. There's good famous and then there's bad famous. Right. And Cause there's famous also that you can have a platform then like you were talking about before. So like that exactly. fame isn't necessarily a bad thing. It also, I guess it depends on what you do with it. Right. How exactly. You use it. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. All right. So speaking of fame, if there were two celebrities you could choose to be your parents, they can be alive or dead. Who would you choose? I would say Jada Pinkett and Will Smith. <laughs> Cause they just look like the ultimate cool parents. Um, I would say, yeah, I would say them. Just, I was actually re-watching uh, Fresh Prince of Bel Air, and I was looking at Will Smith. Um, you know, in 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 that show, I was watching the pilot and seeing how just beautifully he moved and and how fun and and charismatic he was. I I, I imagine I was like, could that be my dad, or are you my dad? Um, I'm, I'm sure he's a lot of people's dads um, in in That's their so minds. Funny. Well, yeah. I'll tell you they what. Look, they look like jo a fun family. Jovan Wade said the same thing. No! I asked him the same question. Will no, Smith. Well, he didn't say Jada. He didn't say Jada. He said Michelle Obama for a mom, but he did say Will Smith. So it looks like you guys are going to have the same dad. Oh my God. It looks like we have the same dad. Yeah. Oh my. Well, that, that it takes away any possibility of, of having, of us having a romantic storyline uh, right. on season three. Um, sorry. So sorry, Jovan. Um, so funny though that you guys are the same person. Oh, Mich can Michelle Obama be my mom too? <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'm gonna give it yes. Um, okay, so who is the coolest living legend that you've ever met? John Leguizamo. Oh, why? How is he so? I mean, he is cool, but like, tell me about him in real um, life. John Leguizamo has just always, for me, has been. Um, just such an amazing actor um, and just such a fearless um, artist. And I really saw him, I saw so much of myself in him, not only because he is Colombian, um, but because I just always saw so much truth in him. And, and I, I, I found solace there. I found connection. I found community. I found, um, humor and love in his performances. And so getting to meet him was always sort of one of my, um, you, you know, one of the, one of those, one of those things that I really, really wanted was to meet, to meet him in person. And I've had an opportunity to meet him now twice. Um, and w when I went to his show, uh, Latin history, uh, for morons, uh, and just, and, and he's, and he's just, he's a, he's a true thespian and I just admire him so much. And, and not only that, but he is a huge advocate for the Latinx community and for black and brown people. Um, and I just, he, he is also a freedom fighter and that's why I admire him. Okay, great. And what, tell me one thing that you feel like people misunderstand about immigration or, um, the Latinx experience that you wish people knew. Um, I mean, those are really two separate questions. I wish, you can I wish answer, people, you can say both. yeah, I, people need to know that the immigration system as it is, um, is designed to be working exactly the way it's working, um, to keep black and brown people out, um, and to exploit people. That is what this system looks like right now. Um, people say it's broken. People say it needs reform. Even I was of my, of the mind that need, that would promote 
um, immigration reform. We need to, we need immigration reform. We need immigration reform. We need uh, an abolitionist uh, mentality, I think, when it comes to immigration in this country, um, just like policing in this country. It needs to be completely, the, the immigration system needs to be wiped out and start anew, right? It doesn't work as it's working because it was never intended to work. Um, and that's what I was, will say about that. I'll tell you something about the Latinx experience. We are tough. We are resilient and we are working uh, to make this country what it should be. I don't know what to say about the Latinx, but can you take that out? No, you said and, that beautifully. <laughs> no, no, no. What you just said, you did it beautifully. You shouldn't have cut yourself off. Okay. Okay. Yes. I'll, I'll keep, I'll keep the first thing about, about immigration and then. Yeah. Okay. But you did it beautifully. <laughs> That's good. I don't think you don't, you, we should not nix that. I, I love that though. What would you say about the Latin X experience in this country? Yeah. Or what, what I think the way I asked it was, what would you like people to understand or what do you, would you like people to know about the Latin X experience? So I guess in this country would be, yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes it more clear. I guess the one thing I would say would be that we will not, um, the La that Latinx people will not be free until black people are free. I think I'll say that there. Okay, and that's good. And I like that little clip. I feel like I can put that on social media too. It's gonna be a nice little, little <laughs> snippet, um, if you don't mind. I don't mind anything. I have, I have spoken and it's there for you to use. <laughs> Okay, good. Um, let me ask you one question too about what we were, you were talking about because I think you can help with this. So a lot, there's been a lot of talk about defunding the police, right? Mm -hmm. And I know that I saw you post about it and I think so many people totally misunderstand what that word means or that yeah. the means. Yeah. So, you know, like John Oliver said it beautifully. He kind of summed it up beautifully. I've seen it a few other places. Why don't you, you want to try it? Just tell, sure. like, explain what, what's a misunderstanding about defunding the police and what is it really? Okay. I think the misconception is that it's going to be like law, like defunding the police would be like a lawless land and that everyone's going to get to just do whatever they want. And then crime is going to, uh, just surge, uh, because there's there, what people think it is, it says it's going to be like no law enforcement at all. And I think that what people need to understand is that defunding the police literally means, yeah, taking resources, resources that you put into the, you know, militarized, uh, organizations and, and, and the police and take those resources and invest them in communities and invest them in people who need them. Um, the reason why we have police really started um, out of slave catching, right? It really, it really started and it stemmed from there. And so we have a history in this country with police brutality against the black community, the black and brown community. And so what, what happens when we invest in those same communities that you are policing? If you, if you give communities um, uh, resources to, for housing, for food, for health care, um, Mental we know, health also. We know yeah. that when communities are taken care of in that way, then there will be less crime, less need for police. So let's stop increasing the police budget and start increasing um, uh, and, and money and, and increasing um, programs that are going to actually help and heal our communities. That is what defunding the police is. I believe in abolishing the police completely taking away the police because we see and we know that we don't need police police officers as first responders, right? This is what they're saying we need these inflated budgets for. We're saying, oh, well, we need police to go in and help people with mental health crises. We need people, we need police to go in and help with homelessness. We need pe police to go in to help with domestic disputes. What we're saying is that only 
that only furthers the problem. And that's why you see it not helping our communities. What we actually need is mental health professionals. We need um, people who are, who, are, who are trained in violence prevention. We need people who work with people who have um, addiction issues. The, that is what we need. We need help with our, with our mental health in this country. We don't need police or people to come in with badges and guns to protect you from what? Your own mental health? That doesn't make any sense. Um, so we want those resources to actually pay professionals and build communities that are going to help each other. Um, and we've already seen it in many places where, where you don't see a lot of police presence. You see it in very rich neighborhoods. You see, you know, you see it in all the, all of these places where, you know, you, you don't, you don't need policing and communities are thriving, are thriving. Um, so that's what I would say about that. Yeah. And also not only to, I'm just thinking about the mental health aspect. Yeah. I was a therapist before I did this. So I'm mm -hmm. always tuned into the whole mental health aspect of things. So, um, somebody with mental health issues doesn't need, not you said like they don't need the police coming in. Well, not only that's true. Not only do they not need the police coming in, but that's, they need something totally different. Mm -hmm. Somebody who really understands those issues right. and can help them go to where they are and knows what to right. do to actually service them. So yes. Yeah. Well said. All right. So um, let's wrap up. It's been lovely to meet you. Thank you so much Thank for you. a wonderful conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing what you're laughing. <laughs> Just let me go on and on. I was like, and then I worked at this place. But that's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, Don't yeah. you think? Yeah, of course. I mean, that's, I mean, that's, what, that's what you want to find out about people who are famous or like who have, who have reached some, you know, some, um, I guess, notability or whatever. Um, you want to hear their origin story. You want to hear what they, yeah. how they came up, what they did before the, before what they're doing now. Exactly. So <laughs> I know you think like it's whatever you're going on and on, but that's exactly what people are tuning in for. So they can catch the, the little same old questions, you know, if they want to tune into that show or that show or whatever, like mm -hmm. entertainment tonight or whatever today show or whatever, but right. This is, this is what's really interesting, I think. Right, I think so too. I think yeah, so, too. So, so thank you for doing all that. Thank I you so it. much, great questions. Thank you for having this conversation with me. That was Diane Guerrero. Catch my videos with Diane and her co-star Joe Van Wade on youtube.com slash really famous. Watch Doom Patrol on HBO Max and get yourself some convenient and potentially life-changing therapy at betterhelp.com slash really famous. I'm Kara. Thanks for hanging out with Diane and me. I'll be back soon with O. Talia Shire and Jan from The Office. Plus Peter Brady, AKA Christopher Knight returns and more. Please stay tuned.